Over the past year, DARPA has been funding Trail of Bits to investigate the extent to which blockchains are truly decentralized. In June 2022, they released a 25-page report detailing all the ways they believe blockchains are vulnerable to attack, focusing on Bitcoin and Ethereum. Today I'm going to explain all the main points from this report. I'm Jack, and on Eat the Blocks we help Web2 developers transition into Web3. Trail of Bits, or TOB, is an international team that provides technical security and assessments to some of the world's most targeted organizations. The research has been known to be cutting edge, using real-world attacker mentality to reduce risks. The report first talks about how blockchains can be forked like Ethereum's 2016 DAO attack. This isn't a problem until unexpected things happen from these forks. For example, Ethereum's Constantinople hard fork reduced the gas costs of certain operations. This was good until we realized that contracts relied on these previous gas costs to prevent re-entrancy attacks. Luckily it was avoided, but you can see how something small could potentially slip through and cause disaster. The report then talks about how Turing-complete blockchains are never truly immutable. These are what you call upgradable contracts. Basically, they say it's a security vulnerability to allow these changes a state, in the case that someone sends a transaction expecting a certain state and the contract changing before its execution. Next, they talk about the Nakamoto coefficient. This is the number of entities sufficient to attack the system. Bitcoin is said to have four mining pools that control over 51% of its hash rate, making its coefficient only four. Ethereum was said to only have a coefficient of three. Bitcoin had a higher level of decentralization, while Ethereum had a more stable level throughout 2019. Although these coefficients are low, one could argue that taking control of these mining pools would be way too expensive. Trail of Bit says that the concern here would be if a nation state or in another entire currency attacked the network. TOB then went on to say that proof of stake addresses most of these shortcomings. Here are some of the most popular POS stakes of 2021. As we can see, Ethereum 2.0 gets ranked at a Nakamoto coefficient of 12. It's known that mining pools and staking validators decrease the economic centralization of a blockchain by lowering the barrier to entry, like allowing users to stake any amount of ETH, not just people with 32 plus ETH. However, these entities also become single points of failure. The safety of a blockchain must then rely on these off-chain governance and consensus mechanisms. Next, they talk about the other 51% attacks. Sybil attacks are when a malicious user floods the network with cheap cloud server instances. No mining hardware is required for this. The user would then use these nodes to gain influence. The Sybil attack can then go on to execute an Eclipse attack. This happens when a malicious node spreads bad information to real nodes, making them go out of date. The more out of date nodes, the higher chance of a fork. Every time a fork happens, the hash rate is separated between the two sides. A successful Eclipse attack would try to continue the fork the blockchain, each time reducing hash rate. This could potentially lower the total hash rate just low enough for an entity like a nation state to attack the network. For a blockchain to be safe from this attack, its cost to run multiple nodes must be greater than the cost of running one node. This is called the Sybil cost. This is currently impossible for Bitcoin and Ethereum to do without a trusted third party. This is where the paper talks about graph scaling and peer discovery. The diameter of almost every random, scale-free graph is very small. Bitcoin's diameter should be 5, meaning that every block sent out should be passed to 5 different people in every direction. Their core client has a hard-coded 2-minute delay between passing information. This means that it should take 10 minutes for a block to propagate. Yet the paper says they regularly observe propagation delays of less than 10 minutes. The evidence here points to their suspicion that a dense subnetwork of public nodes is largely responsible for reaching consensus leaving out most of the edge nodes. The next section talks about the actual networks that Bitcoin propagates through. In the last five years, 60% of all Bitcoin traffic has traversed just three internet service providers, and roughly one third of all of those nodes are hosted inside of the United States. Since Bitcoin's traffic is unencrypted, it is possible that an ISP or a nation could drop all of the blockchain messages going through it. This would block all nodes from that entity and make an Eclipse attack much easier. Tor is also the most popular network provider of Bitcoin right now, routing about 20% of its nodes. Over the past year, a malicious actor used a Sybil attack to gain control of up to 40% of Tor exit nodes and rewrote Bitcoin traffic. The last topic is software centrality. It is vital that all nodes operate on the same latest version of software, otherwise consensus errors can happen. A big problem area of this is in large mining pools, where participants continued to use outdated clients. From Trail of Bits network crawl on Bitcoin, they observed that 21% of Bitcoin nodes are running an old version of the Bitcoin core client. They also couldn't find any proof of these large mining pools doing third-party risk assessments. 
Any successful remote code execution could deny service to the entire pool, thus lowering the hash rate, or even directing the hash rate to their malicious benefit, aka stealing the hash rate. Decentralized software is also at risk. This is especially true on Ethereum, where standard protocols and libraries like OpenZeppelin exist. Out of 1,600 smart contracts sampled, they discovered that 90% of the smart contracts were at least 56% like each other. 7% were completely identical. If a security vulnerability were to be found in these main smart contracts, someone with the right power and malicious intent could potentially use this to help launch an attack on the network. Well, that's all for the report. In my opinion, I believe a large entity would need to use multiple of these different attack vectors and align things perfectly to really do any damage to a network. However, this is all still theoretically possible. The more we can understand these threats, the better we can build our blockchains to neutralize them. If you want to have your smart contracts audited by the professionals on the Eat the Blocks team, including Julian himself, then check out the Unblock Labs new website. I'll leave a link in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.